I affirm the reality of an economic science. That's how he starts the chapter yeah. off. He's, he's out of his fucking mind. <laughs> One with absolute certainty, no less. Mm-hmm. Um, I was curious what you guys thought about this, but he says essentially economics is the science of the realization of metaphysics. Where did he say that? Uh, Pretty early on. Rush, uh, third paragraph. Oh, right. On the... right. In other words, economic science is to me the objective form and realization of metaphysics. It is metaphysics in action. Yeah. I was looking a little bit at like the definition of metaphysics because it's like notoriously hard to define. Mm -hmm. It's basically mm -hmm. just a thing beyond physics. I've heard um, this kind of connects it back to the God uh, chapter, but it's kind of Stanford Encyclopedia says the old metaphysics was essentially the study of like the absolute or like the what is that doesn't change. <clears throat> Give me one second. I'm pretty sure in his last work, um, what's it called? Something order. Um, you know, he like puts the forward creation like, of order and humanity. Right. He puts forward like three stages similar to Comte. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like theology, philosophy, and then for him, it's metaphysics. Like that's what he lands on as for Comte, it's science, but for for um, Proudhon, it's metaphysical. I think that's because it, for him, it, it's like an ordering, which has like a metaphysical kind of. Um, twist if to I had it. to offer my understanding, it's like metaphysics, at least in in this context, could be read as the like trying to extrapolate the underlying principles that kind of govern how things work. So it, mm -hmm. so. Um, economic theory, we could say, is trying to figure out, like, okay, so what? When we look at an economy, what, what, what can we? How, how do we make it um, legible to to us? Like, what, what are the principles that we can say are operating here, so that we can make sense of what we're seeing? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that goes along with what we were kind of saying last week with um, him trying to come up with, uh, you know, kind of a hypothesis of God to make things, you know, make sense. Yeah. Um, but I found it interesting. He says, I believe this is the fourth paragraph. Um, after what I have said in the introduction, there is nothing in this which surprise anyone. Uh, after what you said in the introduction, yeah, nothing would surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he says, the labor of man continues the work of God, who in creating all beings did but externally realize the eternal laws of reason. Economic science is then necessarily in a, once a history of ideas, a natural theology, and a psychology. This general outline alone would have sufficed to explain why, having to treat of economic matter, matters, I was obliged to previous uh, obliged previously to suppose the existence of God, and by what by what title I, a simple economist, aspire to solve the problem of certainty. So I think that probably elucidates a little bit some yeah. things we were talking about last week. So. What he's trying to do is make things absolute, so legible. So this solves the problem of certainty, uh, mm. essentially. Like, there's exceptions to like almost every human behavior, but using God, essentially, we're kind of systematically uh, looking at how the economy works. Mm -hmm. That's I'm a lot of words to say. I'm coming up with economic theory. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at notes for the creation of order and humanity, and he he does say that. It goes religion, philosophy, metaphysics, and he defines metaphysics as basically the principle of the, the series, which is the logic of the sciences. Mm -hmm. So, and it uh, describes the independence and the plurality of orders, each of which represents a certain unity and multiplicity. So. <clears throat> um. Does he mention Kant at any point? He does. There's a, a footnote in the introduction where he mentions him. And then in the creation of order and humanity, I think in the second edition, he adds a footnote saying, oh, I realize how similar this is to Kant. Mm. Um, I, think I like the, the next paragraph, just going, keep going where, where Devin stopped. 
but I hasten to say that I do not regard as a science the incoherent ensemble of theories to which, I guess it's ensemble, of theories to which the name political economy has been officially given for almost a hundred years, in which, in spite of the etymology of the name, it is after all but the code of or immemorial routine of property. These theories offer us only the rudiments or first section of economic science. And that is why, like property, they are all contradictory of each other and half the time inapplicable. Uh, I think this, I think a big section of this book is just saying that the conservatives of uh, the economists or the political economists are the thesis, and then the socialists he's going to bring in are going to be the antithesis, and then this book is kind of try to attempt at a synthesis. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how that's how I wrote it. Absolutely. Um, so like this, in fact, if I were to summarize, I was thinking this, um, if I were to summarize this whole like first chapter, it would be to just establish the thesis and antithesis that he's trying to synthesize um, with with the economic work he's doing here. Um, that's basically what this first chapter is for. Um, we've got these two, we've got these two traditions. They're, they're arguing with each other. Both of them have good points to make, but both of them ultimately are wrong. So how, how do we? How do we? What's the next stage? What's the next step after knowing, knowing at this point that both of these um, traditions are inadequate, but also have important things to say? Uh, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Eventually, he sort of gives up on a synthesis, doesn't he? Um, and says that the antimony uh, does not resolve itself mm -hmm. to look way ahead. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. He, his is that in where he goes with dialectic ends up. Yeah. I think that's, it's probably uh, in his constructive stage. It's probably in one of his later works, I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, when he starts uh, developing a more antinomial way of looking at dialectics than, a, than a one where there's, a, like you said, there's a synthesis that actually is able to emerge. Um, we he to... starts to see tensions as sort of permanent and we just have to kind of work in the, in, in the middle. We have to find what works through things like uh, convention and just figure out it, that's that's kind of when it becomes more of a pragmatist, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His later work, you're saying? Yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. know how much later, but like closer to the constructive period for sure than this yeah. is. Yeah, there's some quotes out of his magnum opus, Justice and the Revolution in the Church, that just totally pragmatist related. I mean, they just kind of yeah. just and, fall right in line with that camp. In philosophy of progress, he talks about how um, I can't remember the, the specifics well enough, but um, he's when he's talking about um, price, he's talking about how like we have this abstract law of value that is like uh, completely rigorous, um, but we we can see that like it's there's like a tension in it that keeps it from work from operating like perfectly in in all instances. So so um, what what happens is just free people interacting with each other, kind of just approximate what works for them and uh that's that's kind of how you resolve that is like the, the the logical tension remains there um but uh but through through just people just kind of saying okay well that works for me we can compromise there um you know it, it's able to be resolved in practice that would be something good to about go. reading a bunch what it's you uh, just east, by the way. Yeah, it is. It is justice where he says the antinomy, the antinomy does not resolve itself. Yeah, and that's what Sean was saying in the chat, which was kind of interesting. Which was, it seems that he kind of changes his view on economics in his later constructive period, and it doesn't really seem like much. Uh, there's been much analysis on on how they differ. Mm. Um, I think he's basically saying there is no kind of uh, higher principle. Uh, that you could put, for example, political economy and social socialism into. You just have to kind of um, work with the tension between the two and and kind of use it for your own ends. See, that's a good point. Because, yeah, right, right here he's saying it, it makes up a, an economic science. And what I've what I've heard is after the revolution of forty eight, he kind of drops the whole approach to science, and he kind of to kind of to what you're saying is like. Let's take science out of the equation, and it's just an internal kind of back and forth between these two categories. Um, I was going to say something. And the only constant is progress. 
Yeah. yeah. Should we talk about a little more about his uh, description of political economy and socialism? Yeah, that's all I was going to read. Just because, here, I'll, I'll just take off. All right. Thus, two powers are contending for the government of the world and cursing each other with the fervor of two hostile religions, political economy or tradition and socialism or utopia. What is then, in more explicit terms, political economy? What is socialism? Political economy is a collection of the observations thus far made in regard to the phenomena of the production and distribution of wealth. That is, in regard to the most common, most spontaneous, and therefore most genuine forms of labor and exchange. Um, then he says over here, political economy is therefore the natural history of the most apparent and most universally accredited customs, traditions, practices, and methods of humanity and all that concerns the production and distribution of wealth. Um, consequently, political economy calls itself a science that is a rational, systematic knowledge of regular and necessary facts. Socialism, which, like the god Vishnu, ever dying and ever returning to life, has experienced within a score of years its 10,000th incarnation in the persons of five or six, how do you say that word, revelators? Revelators. Yeah. Socialism affirms the irregularity of the present constitution of society and consequently of all its previous forms. It asserts and proves that the order of civilization is artificial, contradictory, inadequate, that it engenders oppression, misery, and crime. It denounces, not to say calamities, the whole past of social life and pushes on with, with all its might to a reformation of morals and institution. Socialism concludes by declaring political economy a false and uh, sophistical hypothesis devised to enable the few to exploit the many and applying the maxim, whatever that one is. <laughs> a fructibus cognositus. Uh, I've never studied Latin, so that's... It's that's something, the fructibus, it, that sounds like something to do with fruit. And cognusetis, I don't know. Yeah, the, the fruit something of the mind or Knowledge like or that. recognizing <laughs> or acknowledging. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know Latin either, but I can kind of blag it. Mm. Um... It ends with a like, demonstration of intelligence. By the fruits you will know. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. I was close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the list of human talent. Um, oh, I liked this. this. This stood out to me. Uh, but if political economy is false, jurisprudence, which in all countries is the science of law and custom, is false also. Since founded on the distinction of thine and mine, it supposes the legitimacy of the facts described and classified by political economy. The theories of public and international law, with all the varieties of representative government, are also false, since they rest on the principle of individual appropriation and the absolute sovereignty of wealth. So that, I think we kind of skipped over it when we were um, reading earlier, but he mentioned, he said something earlier about property being the foundation of, of all institutions. So this is kind of him providing an example of what he's talking about, two examples, jurisprudence and theories of public and international law. So he's basically saying that like property is kind of the basis of the ideologies that we're using to to formulate our institutions and our, our governmental systems at this point. Um, and I think he would even say it has been all along or in, in, in one of its forms. Property is taken various forms over time, but like, you know, whatever form property takes kind of, it helps shape the other institutions. I. I don't know if you'd go so far as to, as Marxist to say it's like the economic base with a superstructure, but he's at least like he's at least saying that these institutions are interwoven with each other, and that property has a very key role in determining um, our, our legal structures and um, institutions and stuff like that. I think that's a pretty important insight. Um, and something I also wanted to mention was um, he. Um, some people try or try to read Perdona's later saying that, oh, actually, property is a good thing. I, I'm actually in favor of property. After all, ANCAPs usually like to point out to like some favorable things he said about property, like when they cherry pick. It's important to um, point out that he's al he also said that his criticisms of property never stopped. Like like everything he, he ever criticized property for is still true, but he just he, he, it's, it's, it's the antinomy. It's like we, we kind of like property is impossible and yet we kind of need it. So we have to figure out what the hell to do about it. Like that that's another example of the an antinomy that can only be resolved through the action of free people sorting out what works for them. Mm. 
So, that reminds me of a quote where he says, I, I, I don't remember the quote exactly, but it's something about, I never meant to sort of, um, what was it? Oh, something like, basically tear down property by sovereign decree or something. Yeah, um, he says, I, I just meant to put everything in its place, uh, you know, kind of uh, destroy the principles behind it, but then yeah. you can still uh, make, you know, make the most of it. Um, uh, despookify it if we were to put it in, exactly, if yeah. we were to put it in sterner <laughs> terms. <laughs> I think um, what he's doing with the political economy is he's kind of setting up the. He even says later the hierarchical conservatives and socialists as the egalitarian anti-capitalists. So he's saying political economy is both a collection of facts and rights. A fact in that they have a collection of observed phenomena and a collection of theories and a right and that these kind of activities are governed by the authority of the human race, essentially. So, yeah. So, he's, these are two sides warring over, uh, he says later, that they both agree that society should be harmonious, have liberty, order, and whatnot. They just, uh, they're looking at it from two sides and they can't get past each other, which is kind of the purpose of this synthesis. Mm -hmm. And he also says that both sides try to use science as their legitimator. So political economy will say, yeah, we're, we are science. And the socialists say the same thing. We're, we're using science. Exactly. I mean, he's saying, yeah, he's saying actually neither of you are using science. And just because uh, you you uh, brought up legitimacy. Um, also, he charges political economy with being like, kind of just a means of legitimizing the current the current order of property and jurisprudence and government and stuff like that. So political economy, yeah, it's... it hasn't so far been so much as science is just sort of like a a post hoc like, ah, oh, you see why this is everything we're doing is actually good and fine, and this is just the natural order of things and yada yada. Exactly, it's founded on tradition, which he's pointing out constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's another quote. I mean, it's just summing up what we're talking about. Uh, Thus society finds itself at its origin, divided into two great parties, the one traditional and essentially hierarchical, which, according to the object it is considering, calls itself by turns royalty or democracy, philosophy or religion, in short, property. The other, socialism, which, coming to life at every crisis of civilization, proclaims itself preeminently anarchical, and atheistic, that is rebellious against all authority, human and divine. Now modern civilization has demonstrated that in conflict of this nature, the truth is found, not in the exclusion of one of the opposites, but wholly and solely in the reconciliation of the two. It is, I say, a fact of science that every antagonism, whether in nature or in ideas, is resolvable <clears throat> in a more general fact or in a complex formula which harmonizes the opposing factors by absorbing them, so to speak, in each other. Yeah, so, so that's, you know, he's saying that what we said earlier, uh, he's looking for a synthesis in so many words. Yeah. As Sean pointed out, Sean Murdoch, uh, not Sean Murdoch, Sean uh, Wilbur, uh, he pointed out, he posted something the other day that was showing that Proudhon eventually lays out like two laws of the universe. One of them is the universal law of antagonisms. Just every, you know, everything that exists will find that it has an antagonism. And then there's the law of reconciliation. I, I think that's what he, or maybe not reconciliation, but uh, balance or something. But just showing how those are kind of like the two ways that Proudhon is approaching the universe. Is that he sees everything in conflict, but he also sees that everything can kind of be balanced in a way. And I, I think evolution kind of gives a good view of that in general. Like you... You go look at some island, like everything is, is competing with each other, but in some way they find like a harmony among each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, some Marxist Leninist was trying to get me to say, to say once that, uh, like, like everything begins with conflict, conflict is the driving force of everything, everything is always in conflict with everything else. And I was just like, I don't really like conflict, it's obviously like an important driving factor in things, but like, if you're not re leaving any room for like the harmonizing of, of various forces, the way these they can associate and work together, um, even spontaneously, um, 
I, th I think you're kind of just fetishizing violence at that point. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. like, uh, like by excluding harmony, I think I think that it was telling about his worldview, especially given like how 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 much he emphasized the need for a vanguard party to make war on the bourgeoisie, like like, and I mean literally like war. <laughs> um, so uh, it's it's interesting how this how this very like foundational like metaphysical view can can really shape your um just your, your general outlook on everything um when it comes to praxis and stuff like that mm -hmm. so. exactly um, makes me think of georg simmel i don't know if you ever studied him in sociology he's a conflict theorist but he says there's there's different forms of conflict you know there there's extreme conflict with just ruins everything but then there's also kind of like a healthy amount of conflict like you know two sports teams or something like that you know it's good to have some conflict but it can't just take over everything mm -hmm. um i highlighted oh sorry actually we already read that never mind um so i think we're almost done with this first section of the first chapter then right yeah um <clears throat> So he wants to the, this, the next section that he says he's going to try to make his point clearer by some examples. Um, so so then he talks about the the section two inadequacy and, and theories of and criticism. Um, he starts it off by uh, talking about social science, which I'm sure you guys would love to talk about. <laughs> what <laughs> me? Yeah. No. Um. Let me see. I have some notes here. So I, th I thought he his characterization of science was worth noting. He said science in general is a logically ar is the logically arranged and systematic knowledge of that which is, mm -hmm. and is is capitalized. Um. And he says, mm -hmm. okay, go ahead. He says uh, social science is the logically arranged and systematic knowledge, not of that which society has been, nor of that which it will be. But of that which it is in its whole life, that is, in the sum total of its successive manifestations, for there alone can it have reason and system. Social plants must include human order, not alone in such or such a period of duration, nor in a few of its elements, but in all its principles and in the totality of its existence, as if social evolution spread throughout time and space should find itself suddenly gathered and fixed in a picture, which exhibiting the series of the ages and the sequence of phenomena re revealed their connection and unity. Such must be the science of every living and progressive reality. Such uh, social science is uh, indisputably so. Yeah, like again, like we need we need to abstract from the commonalities that the like every era and every like across time and space is going to have obviously different expressions um, of human organization and, and social reality. But what what are the what what do all the expressions have in common, and what can we what abstract principles can we um, derive from those commonalities? Uh, kind exactly. of just going back to what I was saying earlier. Um, yeah, the the reason he starts part two of chapter one like this is because this comes immediately after the political economy, which is supposed to represent tradition or what has been, and the socialists, which is what will be. So, the idea of a social science is to combine, look at society as a totality, which he will continue to do as he sees he tries to identify. Uh, what the socialists have been in previous times and kind of compare. So I think that's important to keep in mind when you read this chapter. Mm -hmm. And then he, he's also kind of saying, well, what what is the question of social science? What are they trying to solve? He says at the, on the bottom of the page for me, uh, the question now must, most disputed is unquestionably that of the organization of labor. And then over here he says, <clears throat> As for us, guided by the idea that we have formed of social science, we shall affirm against the socialists and against the economists, not that labor must be organized, not that it is organized, but that it is being organized. This is one of my favorite for your own quotes. <laughs> um, yeah, labor, we say, is being organized. That is, the process of organization has been going on from the beginning of the world and will continue till the end. Yeah. So he's um, very much a, a process philosopher. Then I don't know if yeah. you've read anything about yeah. that. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually really interested in reading uh, Whitehead and seeing where, seeing if there's anything we as Perdonians might be able to uh, draw hmm. on in Whitehead. But um, yeah, I what I think this is important is because 
you know, he, he, he's, he's getting at that tension between tradition and, you know, change. And he's, 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 he's saying that like, it's not that there were, we're currently already having things figured out, like how we're doing things is like, just, you know, how things have always been done. It's not that it's just staying that way. And that's a good thing. And it's not that, you know, things are actually awful and we need to make sure we're changing them. It's that there, no, right now in daily life where we are actively through our daily life actions, just organizing things right now in the present, he's bringing us into the present and saying, we like, he's kind of like reminding us of our agency. You know what I mean? Um, which is something I find that you don't get a lot in the Marxist tradition. And it's something I, I think an advantage we have over the Marxist tradition, because we're not, we're not waiting for the proletariats to, uh, for the proletarians to, um, you know, ha have that, uh, like overcome their false conscience. We're saying, oh, right now we can start prefiguring, like the type of labor organization we want, the type of any kind of social organization we want. And I think that um, that prefigurative sort of here and now daily life, <clears throat> let's let's you know, things are currently happening. I think that sort of attitude really like. That is something that the anarchist movement did inherit from Proudhon, whether or not they really realize it through our prefigurative politics um, approach to politics. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something I think it's really cool to make explicit um, because I think a lot of the time when, when people uh, fall into doomerism, they kind of, it's, <laughs> it's, I think a lot of that has to do with like the sort of like expectation that like the revolution is something that's going to be coming eventually. It's almost like the second coming of Jesus sort of thing. It's, it's esch 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 eschatological. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I don't think that's the right approach to understanding how, how social change actually works. And, you know, you may just be one person, but, you know, by meeting like-minded people, like doing stuff like what we're doing now, you know, kind of help to, to raise awareness, to teach, to, ed um, educate, agitate, organize, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm waxing a little bit, but you know, that's, I think this is like an important sort of slogan even for the anarchist movement to uh revive but. yeah it's like society is something that we actively not only participate in but construct all of us yeah. collectively um and that's something i really liked in in uh in uh, berger and luckman's so social construction of reality they really emphasize the construction of social reality in daily life it's something we inherit but it's also something we actively participate in and it's always changing because every every iteration of an action every person is in a unique position in society. So um, there's there's a sort of a repetition, but every repetition is different. And so like there's an active process of, of flux, um, even in things that resemble each other it's across time and space. It's an impact, I would say, an evolution. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good way of putting it. Especially since like that, um, the changing conditions of um, outside of, human action also of course affect you know the shape of human society as well so um, material conditions if you will <laughs> i'm kind of curious what prudon means here i didn't quite get it he's saying that socialism and political economy then while waging a burlesque war pursue in reality the same idea the organization of labor which um i'm confused about because i'm curious if he's saying that they're both wa waging war on what the organization of labor would look like, or they're unconsciously tending towards the same synthesis. So he actually, let me. Find or maybe it's even both. Um, I th I think it is a bit of both because he says, oh, where, "Where's the where is the quote?" There's some some part point in the chapter he says something to the effect of they both are after like, um, liberty and and free uh, interaction and the, stuff like that. Yeah, I I, I highlighted it. For since, after all, socialism and political economy pursue the same end, namely liberty, yeah. order, and well-being among men, it is evident yeah. that the conditions to be fulfilled, in other words, the difficulties to be overcome to attain this end, are also the same for both, and that it remains only to examine the methods attempted or proposed by either party. Yeah, so, you know, they have the same goals, really, but, like, their approaches are different. Like, one one seeks to use tradition to achieve those goals, the other seeks to... Uh, this novelty to attain attain those goals. Yeah. Um, also, I uh, uh, Devin, you can uh, go. I was going to say, Devin, I, I know you've been going to Unitarian Universalist Church uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
They a lot of times that when I was a kid, I would go there a lot. The, the, the analogy that you always hear there is the blind men. I mean, the parable that you always hear is the blind men and the elephant. Have you came across that yet? No, I don't think they've mentioned it. Uh, well, that's the one that a lot of Proudhon's arguments seem to follow for me, which is imagine like two blind men. One guy's holding, touching the trunk, and he's describing the trunk what it is, and the other guy's touching the tail, and he's describing the tail. Oh. And they're both yeah. like yelling yeah, at have, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, 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 have, like, um, no, they have they have they that, um, they're both describing the same thing, but they're describing it from different orientations, you know. And so, if they don't work together to describe what they're, you know, feeling, then they they miss each other. But if they work together, you can kind of come to a, a similar, a, a you know, a picture that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I find that that Proudhon's kind of he's using that analogy like all the time. That kind yeah. of approach. Yeah, I like that. That's a that's a cool connection. You see this all the time in left libertarian spaces because this is the real intersection of where socialism and capitalism kind of collide almost. Mm-hmm. Um, if I may, there's a quote that is I really like that comes directly after. But both are guilty of disloyalty to science and of mutual ca- uh, calumny, where on the one hand, political economy, mistaking for science its scraps of theory, d- denies the possibility of future progress and when socialism abandoning tradition aims at reestablishing society on undiscoverable bases. So I think that kind of wraps up what you were saying, Gray, about mm-hmm. the elephant. Yeah. And he says, socialism is nothing but a profound criticism and continual development of political economy. Yeah, they said, yeah, they're like, they're talking about the same thing. And they're just yeah, like, yeah. Um, I, I think it's interesting to go so far as to say that socialism is a development of political economy. Yeah. Continual development. I mean, I think it's Marx crazy. agree with that. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's all I was going to say was that Marx is, is saying that's his big disagreement with Proudhon, saying that no, 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 no. Political economy is just a bunch of crap, you know? It's a bunch of bourgeois. The laws of political economy that you think are, are just the mirage, you know? It's like what we really need to do is embrace society, and then you don't really need this alienating economy anymore i haven't read the whole book but baudrillard wrote a, wrote a book called mirror of production where he basically says that a problem in marx is that marx tries to use political economy to critique political economy but like is still so trapped within the um, discourse of political economy that he didn't really break free of it he didn't like like he he's still like trapped in the in the logic of political economy like homo economicus and stuff like that mm-hmm. and that's why he makes economic uh, the economic like relations of society, the base um, of all of all social relations with you know the base superstructure model. So um, that's is my point. Bringing that up is that's actually kind of something that Mar- Marx gets criticized for later on, <laughs> um, and he's trying to criticize Proudhon for that. Um, I think it's crazy that Proudhon gets pegged as a utopian socialist when he's clearly. It sounds like he's trying to kind of establish a science of socialism. Yeah, mm. he's doing. He did what Marx wanted to do before Marx had the chance, and uh, Marx never, never got over it. He died mad yeah, about he's, it. He's uh, criticizing the utopians. Pretty. I've been reading a little bit of socialism, utopian and scientific, and it's kind of, essentially, pretty similar criticisms that the socialists at the time were constructing these little utopias in an ocean of property, and not really getting anywhere. Right. That's Engels' argument. Yeah, or I guess it was written by Engels. Yeah. Yeah, I think I like Lang- Engels a lot less than Marx. I'm not a huge fan of either, but yeah, like Engels, Engels is kind of a dick. I think Marxists <laughs> are just unconsciously Engelsists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Engels really influenced Orthodox Marxism. You yeah, know, he that's... basically he basically established it after Marx died. Right. Like it, I think it's pretty telling that at Marx's funeral there was like ten people. Like he didn't have a big following at his death. But it's after his death that he really starts to take off, and particularly through Engels, you know, he was going around kind of being the propagandist, and you know, he he's really the big reason why it, it took off in Russia the way it did, was due to his influence. I saw a video once where this guy was talking about um, how, for Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and even just Christianity in general, you you need um, you know, these movements wouldn't have really got off the ground and stayed off the ground after the the main 
like leader died if it wasn't for like a, a second in command who was able to step up and kind of just take take right. charge and establish the orthodoxy and everything. Um, that 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 was true in Mormonism. That was true, like I said, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And like you know, it's like Engels was to Marx what Paul was to Jesus. You know, like right. he, was, he was the one who kind of took over. And um, both of those, like I think Paul was, my understanding, pretty educated. I don't know about his wealth, but I know Engels was, you know, a very resourceful person. He had a lot of resources. His father owned factories in England and, and Manchester, I believe. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, and then the book, you know, written to this, the the poverty of philosophy by Marx. Like in its day, I was reading about it not long ago. I think he only he published. He had to foot the bill for it, so he published like eight hundred copies in his lifetime. It sold poorly, you know, nobody really noticed it. It was not until his death that it became reissued, translated, and became what it is today. So in their lifetimes, it was like a flop. Like, nobody read it. Whereas this book was much more well-known at the time. Today, nobody reads this one. You know, it's kind of a paradox. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I could find something that I pulled from this that might be good to talk about that we haven't mentioned already. Um, oh, I, in my notes that I wrote for this along like two years ago when I first read this chapter, I said um, that like labor, labor is being organized as kind of um, kind of runs counter to the idea that like mutualism is a theory of the firm or like capitalism with workers co-ops because like, if he's saying that labors are always being organized, then we understand that like uh, we're not just going to say, "Oh, we just need workers' cooperatives." Like, oh no, we have to be radically open to new ways of organizing and like like that are going to change over time. It's not just mutualism isn't just like a blueprint for how workers should should engage in pr production. It's you know, it's, a, it's a way of approaching that question um, more than anything. Yeah. He begins around this part to talk about usury. Maybe we should yeah. get into. I think this is an important point. Yeah. Um, let me quickly find a spot. I'm actually... Uh, you guys can continue without me. I'm just going to... Um, I'll just unplug my mic. I gotta go to the bathroom real quick. Okay. But I'll be listening. I'll allow it. You'll allow it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, General Secretary. <laughs> So essentially, he's talking about there's a conflict by the mandates of essentially, I believe, Catholicism or Christianity, that usury was basically mandated out of existence, like we abolished it through authority. But there was also that lived on farm rent, which Proudhon says by the error of the old uh, med uh, medieval christians or whatever they didn't recognize this as any sort of wrong so when this was presented essentially they generalized the mythology of the farm rent to usury and now they allow usury um, this is uh this is what happens when he says that they turned back to the conservative political economy or essentially like the authority at the time the conservatives to enact to give faith in them to generalize uh the principles on which it lay so the authority of privilege is essentially extended to capital in the which he's going to get to is the myth of the productiveness of capital mm -hmm. yeah back in the day like catholicism was was very had their hands all over economic activity you know they wouldn't allow certain things and that was the big Protestant Reformation was big in that it allowed all these people in towns and you know these small cities to finally kind of you know shoo away the Catholic Church and be like, all right, we're going to do what we think is best, which includes you know usury and all kind of loans and and that, that's kind of you know why people say that the Protestant Reformation and the emergence of capitalism kind of go together because it's finally allowing these practices that have been forbidden by the church, finally allowing them to come out in the open. 
Yeah, the first revolution was essentially a, a, a liberal revolution against religion and tradition and the church um, mm -hmm. for the benefit of free enterprise. Yeah. Yeah, because back in the day, it was kind of a stagnant society. You know, you had the the feudal lords and the serfs and the church, and the state really didn't have much of a role back then. And then the Protestant Reformation is really the, the Protestants linked themselves with the state, and they, the state was able to, like, shake free of the church finally. You know, the state had kind of... A lot of people forget that the state had kind of withered away back, like, when the Roman Empire fell. And it wasn't until around the time of the Protestant Reformation, that the state really gets, like, unchained from the church into what it is today. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a reason to make a distinction between the modern state and states that weren't modern or that were pre-modern because the state sort of looking quite different, like you said, around the time of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Weber talks about that, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Centralization, the bureaucracy that came with modernity um, was quite distinct from what came before, even if there were traces of it before. So um, I'm kind of curious because I feel like this goes back to his construction of a social science. Is He's kind of identifying socialism with pointing out the contradictions of the status quo or like the thesis. So in the olden times, it would be that we uh, uh we forbid usury but we allow farm rent and in this circumstance all that socialism could demand in such a case was either that political economy should be directed to reconcile its theories or that it might be itself entrusted with this difficult task and uh We see that the whole trouble is due to the fact that one of the parties does not wish to see while the other refuses to advance, which I think kind of exemplifies what we were saying earlier uh, about the elephant again. Mm. <clears throat> I don't have a whole about... lot else like, highlighted for this section. I was a little bit out of it when I was going through it the other day. Um, and I've had to spend the last few days working on schoolwork, so I, had, I didn't really get a chance to revisit it. Yeah, it's fine. So I don't, I don't know how much I have to add for the like the remaining stuff, but the last I, thing I, I have, I mean, yeah, I don't really have a ton left. The one big thing I point out is how he introduces his value. Um, I don't know what page, but for me, it's forty-four. I'll just read this passage. <clears throat> Uh, now that such a relation may exist and be estimated, there must necessarily be a law, internal or external, which governs wages and prices. And since in the present state of things, wages and prices vary and oscillate continually, we must ask, what are the general facts, the causes, which makes value vary and oscillate? And within what limits this oscillation takes place? But this very question is contrary to the accepted principles. For whoever says oscillation necessarily supposes a mean direction toward which value's center of gravity continually tends. Um, I remember thinking when I first read Perdon's thoughts on value in this that um, he, he does kind of, he's already ahead of a lot of the marginalist criticisms, and this was decades before the marginalists were really writing. Um, I don't know if you agree with that. And your recent work there, Hades, but um, um, I have I haven't uh, done chapter two yet. Yeah, I have it in the back of my mind, but I feel like it's probably not going to land well, just from where I'm at. Yeah, well, we'll find out. Um, let's see. I had some stuff that was, I highlighted like the first time I read this, where he talks a little bit about Malthus that I wanted to bring up um the con the condemnation of political economy has been formulated by malthus in this famous passage a man who was born into a world already occupied his family unable to support him and society not requiring his labor such a man i say 
has not the least right to claim any nourishment, whatever. He is really one too many on the earth. At the great banquet of nature, there is no plate laid for him. Nature commands him to take himself away, and she will not be slow to put her order into execution. This, then, is the necessary, the fatal conclusion of political economy, a conclusion which I shall demonstrate by evidence hitherto unknown in this field of inquiry. Death to him who does not possess. Um, and then later, a little bit later, he says, um, the error of Malthus, or rather of political economy, does not consist in saying that a man who has nothing to eat must die, or in maintaining that, under the system of individual appropriation, there is no course for him who has neither labor nor income but to withdraw from life by suicide, unless he prefers to be driven from it by starvation, such as on the one hand, the law of our existence, such as on the other, the consequence of property. And M. Rossi has taken altogether too much trouble to justify the good sense of Malthus on this point. Um, the era of, then a little bit later, the era of Malthus, the radical vice of political economy, consists in general terms in affirming as a definitive state a transitory condition, namely the division of society to patricians and proletaires, and particularly in saying that in an organized and consequently solid, uh, solidaire society, there must be some who possess a labor and consume, while others have neither possession nor labor nor bread. So I, I like that because he's, he's, you know, it's 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 something we all know at this point, but like you know, he's pointing out that like the problem with political economy is it's naturalizing a system that's not natural, that's that's transitory, that's um, you know, that's not permanent, and it's saying that this is this is the way things are, and you know, nothing we can do about it. That people who are starving are starving just because of natural laws of of the world, and they just have to die. And Perdon's like, what the fuck, dude? Like, <laughs> are, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> um, hold on, my my uh, my kettle's whistling. He says this earlier, but I think a good a central topic is going to be that all labor should leave in excess, which mm -hmm. he talks about earlier. Is this going to really get into the meat of exploitation and its effects on society that is going to become important later? He talks about, does he talk about that quite a lot in this book then? Because obviously he kind of tackled it in What is Property. Um, I've seen this book referenced by a lot of individualists as uh, how exploitation affects society, which I'm sure we're going to get into sometime soon. Mm. It's a really dense book. I mean, there's, there's so Very much in here. Book. And the fact that there's yeah. two volumes, man. Yeah. Um, like, I like I'm looking at my notes for this. I have so many notes on chapter two. Um, yeah, so true. fucking many. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Um. Oh yeah. I thought the last paragraph, chapter one, is worth reading. It kind of <clears throat> shows a little bit where he's gonna go. I'll read it. Thus, political economy is justified neither by its maxims nor by its works. And as for socialism, its whole value consists in having established this fact. We are forced then to resume the examination of political economy since it alone contains, at least in part, the materials of social science. And to ascertain whether its theories do not conceal some error, the correction of which would reconcile fact and right reveal the organic law of humanity and give the positive conception of order. I like what, that he calls it an organic law. Mm -hmm. significant. I don't know if I can um, extrapolate on it this second. I'd have to think about it more, but I, that stands out. Where I think he's going with it is, is justice. You know? but yeah. For, yeah. So if something is, organic is something that can, it, it's adaptable, it's not mechanical, you know, something. Uh, right, it's felt almost. Yeah. Built. Yeah. I think it's yeah. It means it's kind of spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. I think this this sort of ties in with the idea that you know society is in conflict, and we just need to find out how to how to resolve that conflict, mm -hmm. uh, so that it operates on a more organic, natural kind of basis. Mm -hmm. I think you're right about that. I feel like that's. About most of it. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah. As easier this this chapter is easier than the last one. Yeah, I, this one hurt my head a lot less. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm 
I'm going to say that sometime I'm going to go back. After uh, after we do a considerable portion of this book, I want to go back and kind of simplify the preface and maybe upload yeah. a video on that or something. Yeah, so we'll give it up yeah. again in Chapter 8. Yeah, so again at Chapter 8. Yeah, at the end of Volume 1, there's a big discussion. That's where he says God is evil, where he concludes Ooh. God's evil. So uh, I Yeah, I guess we got to wait for, until then. Mm -hmm. Yeah.